Movie House Cinemas, proud sponsors of Tonight with Jerry Kelly. Treat yourself to a movie. Relax in VIP recliner seating without the VIP price tag. At Cityside, Glen Gormley, Makara and Coleraine. Enjoy the show. Thank you, thank you. Hello, welcome to the programme. It's coming to you once again from the E3 studios here at the Belfast Metropolitan College. As you know, a lot of my former colleagues at UTV are working with the media students here at the college to bring you this short eight-part series of Tonight with Jerry Kelly. So, who have we got for you this evening? Well, let's start with one of the cleverest, the wittiest, and the sharpest comedic minds we have in Northern Ireland today. You'll probably know him better as Da from Give My Head Peace. Would you please welcome Tim McGarry? <laughs> Tim, good to see you. Good to see you. Hello. Hello. You know something? Your name goes before you because of all the comedy that you've done. Do people expect you to be funny when you first meet them? Yeah, and they're so disappointed. I was thinking Very that. disappointed yeah. when I actually speak, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, da, da will be on my headstone, you know. Am I, am I the first Irish man on the moon? It'll still be, da, it'll give my head peace, you know. But it's Yeah, not. but unfortunately, Brana, he, he did a film and you weren't in it. Do you know what? It's disgraceful. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know the interesting thing about that? He called the, uh, what do you call the Jimmy Dornan character? Pa. He called him Pa. Pa. Why did he call him Pa? I'll tell you why. Because even Kenny Brown knows that in Northern Ireland, there's only one Da. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually doing an episode of Give My Head Peace coming out at Christmas where Da gets very upset about Belfast and writes his own version called West Belfast. Fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> and he plays the Jimmy Dornan character, so I'm actually on black hair and a beard and all of that. And I, I do the, the sing the, uh, what's the song? He's Everlasting Love. Everlasting Love, yeah. yeah. We do all that. Oh, it's great. And uh, shouldn't let you know, but... Uh, we, who plays the part of Buddy? But Olivia Nash, play, Ma, this plays the part of Buddy. You want to see her in the school uniform? Brilliant. Where are we going to see that? At uh, Christmas time, Christmas time, January time. Yeah, there's four you're, new episodes. You're a busy man. You've got the Blame Game going at the moment. Blame Game is starting tonight as we speak. Turn this off after the, after the show. Turn off NVTV and go to BBC and I. Uh, and who have you play. got this? Who have you got tonight? Well, uh, Joel Dommett. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel Dommett, quite a big name. And, uh, How long have you been doing... The hole in the wall stuff. How long has that been going now? Nice? I know I look remarkably young. Uh, give us. Hey. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, give me. Uh, the hole in the wall gang started professionally as a, as a, in 1996. So 26 years we've been full time with that. And give me a head piece started in 1998. Wow, wow. We're wow, still wow, getting away wow. with it. Remarkable. Still getting away with it. Remarkable. What, why is it so successful? I think because it's it's always topical. We always we, we do a stage show every single year, and we, we uh, renew the the characters are much loved, but we renew the material every single year. We keep up to date with what's in the news and all of that, and people just like the characters. I mean, they're stupid and they're three dimensional and all that, but they work on, on a few levels. You know, there's a little slapstick in there, there's political satire in there. It's a bit marmite though at times. Oh, no, absolutely. No, there are people who hate us, and I I don't mind. It's not North Korea, you know. If you don't like giving a headpiece, switch it off. That's fine. You know, don't worry about it. There are people who love. Uh, who hate give me a headpiece and love the blame game. People who love the blame game hate give me so, 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 That's all right. You know? I mean, you're comedians. You, you, you're just, audiences are audiences. Let them decide. They, they decide who's funny and who's not. How did you get into comedy in the first place? Because you're, you're, you're a qualified lawyer. I was a solicitor for six years, yeah. Working with the... I was working with the Fair Employment Commission and the Equal Opportunities Commission. I eliminated all religious discrimination. Really, in the yeah. day? It took me three years. Thank Jerry. you. Thank, three you, for, year. thank no, you for that. You can no, thank, thank me you. later. <laughs> and then I worked for the EOC and uh, I tried to eliminate all sex discrimination, but that time it took up a little bit. What but, spurred you into co and comedy then? Uh, I met Damon Quinn and Michael McDowell. Uh, Damon Quinn, who plays Cal, and uh, the three of us are still together 40 years on after we met at university. And Damon used to write school plays and stuff and wrote sketches and plays and funny comedy plays and he got us, roped us into being in his plays and then 
when we were at university, we did charity shows because it was around the mid 80s time of the live aid and band aid and stuff yeah. like that. And we were raising money for Oxfam and the likes of that and started putting on shows basically. And well, I mean, one of your shows, I give my headpiece, it was in the Opera House for you did 10 shows in one week. Yeah. Now, yeah. I can't think of many people, if any, and certainly nobody from Northern Ireland could do that. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, I mean, the audience is still there. I mean, we, we just finished a tour in, in March there and we did 10 shows in, in a week. Yeah, and we go all around Northern Ireland. We do three up in Derry and the Millennium Forum and all of that. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, you, will, you know the likes of Olivia Nash? Olivia Nash, who plays Ma, is, is 80 years old. And wow. she wouldn't mind me telling you that because she's still fantastic. She's still going. That's still funny. She's still funny. Her timing is immaculate. Olivia worked away with, with Jimmy Young way, way back That's in the right. 60s and early 70s. And her timing is still immaculate. And we're just, we're just a happy family. We, we have fun doing it. And I think that comes across to the audience as well. You've, you're doing that. You've also got your radio programme, the, yeah. long, the Long and the Short long of and It. The Short of It, the History Show. Yeah. Which is about... Uh, it's uh, it's called the long and the short of it because uh, I'm technically a lapsed Catholic and I do it with a guy called David Hume who's an orange man, but he's four foot eleven and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called the long and the short of it. Doesn't work on radio, but we're doing a, a couple of TV shows. Uh, and basically, the idea is we come at Irish history from different perspectives. You're a lapsed Catholic. Yeah. I read in a newspaper the other week, no, the other month now. It says I'll give you the headline. Tim McGarry reveals he once considered religion before finding his calling in comedy circuit. That's right, yeah. I was you, going to be a Christian brother at one stage, yeah. And now you don't believe in God? No, no. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big jump, isn't well, it? Well, you know, uh, have you read the news recently? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a patron of the Northern Ireland Humanists, actually. So yes, yeah, so yeah, I believe. Yeah. But, I mean, a lot of your comedy is about Catholics and Protestants. Yeah. And yet you belong to another tribe. No, which makes it easier to laugh at them. <laughs> I keep saying, I mean, sectarianism is a blight in this society and has held this society back for decades. But on the plus side, I've made quite a good career out of it, you know. So, yeah. Swings and roundabouts, Jerry, Swings you know. <laughs> I did the, the, the humanists actually had their conference in Belfast there recently. Uh, and literally I did, I did a free gig for them. And then the next day I got COVID. And I was going, that's a sign. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, he does not like those jokes. There's something. Out of it. <laughs> so what actually does a humanist believe in? Well, a humanist basically believes that, uh, that human beings are good and that morality comes from humans. It doesn't come from, it comes from society and humans and you should treat each other with respect and all that, but we don't, uh, we don't accept that there are gods and we don't accept Bibles and Korans. So and when stuff did that rules. come to you? When did you start to believe in that? Uh, I started to believe in that fairly young, when I was about 14, 15, when I was... Uh, did anything thumb. happen that, that... No, 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 nothing, no, absolutely nothing bad, you know, genuinely. Um, I, my family, were, my mother was very, very religious, and I just, when I was about 14, 15, and I think it was confirmation, uh, and that I went through and I just went, ah, I don't, I'm not buying this, you know, I just, wow. just don't get it, you know, and it's... Uh, there was a great book by the, the philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell who yeah, go, well, I'm not yeah, a Christian, yeah. and it's basically one line in it saying, you know, that God did not create man, man created God. You know, this got very serious. This is very serious all I'm of a sudden. I'm on the plug a show and I'm talking about the existence of God. But no, seriously, I, no, it is, it is quite important to me, you know, uh, that uh, you Obviously. Know, humanism is, is... As is Cliftonville. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's a religion. That is. I got that from my, my uncle who used to play for Cliftonville. My uncle was top scorer for Cliftonville in the late 50s, early 60s. The yeah. first ever Northern Ireland Player of the Year, 1961. And his name was? Kevin McGarry. Kevin, Kevin McGarry. McGarry. Yes, I remember the name. Yeah. He's an uncle of yours. He's an uncle of mine. I didn't know that. Yeah. And he... So that's where your love of Cliftonville came So, well, they were amateur for a long time. So I, when I was very young, I used to be brought there as a punishment, you know, because they lost every single game and all that. <laughs> and they were dreadful. And then they, in the early 70s, they suddenly became, not full time, but they, 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 they paid them and suddenly they, they went through the roof. So I'm a big, big supporter of Cliftonville. And my two sons are massive supporters and we're, we're carrying it on. And they're, they're doing quite well at the moment. Did you ever kick a ball yourself? I I am absolutely useless at kicking a ball. I, I love football, but I couldn't kick a ball. I, I, but I just love football. You know the way? I love football as much as I hate golf, you know, <laughs> which, which is quite a that's, lot. That's another argument. That's, that's another a, that's argument, yeah. Argument. Okay, so what's happening next? When are we going to see you next? Uh, blame game started tonight uh, for seven weeks. Long and the short of it will be on hopefully February time. We're giving ahead piece four episodes out sort of December, January. And then we're in the Opera House with Give Me Head Peace in March. So. Happy Christmas to you. <laughs> <laughs> Need to go lie down now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank the fabulous Tim McGarry. Thank you very much. Thank Tim, you. thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Busy, 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 busy man.
Now, our music tonight comes from uh, two brothers from Newry and County Down who have enjoyed an illustrious career spanning over 30 years. With eight successful albums to their credit, one of them actually going double platinum in Ireland, winning the Best Album of the Year at the Irish Music Awards. And by the way, along the way, they defeated you too for that title. Their last album, Sugar Island, was, I reckon, among their very best. It's very much an autobiographical account of growing up in Newry during the Troubles. So with a track from that album, this one is called Bird's Eye View. Here are Brendan and Declan Murphy, better known as the four of us. Baptism of fire, smoky night in a northern town. See the sky crack open. Come over and down Shooting lightning bolts Down an empty street Daddy shouts now Go to sleep I got a bird's eye view Up on the hill tonight In a boy's eye view It's only a string of light Hi Brandon, good to see you, good to see you. Hi Declan, loved it, loved it, loved it. You know, I was talking to you just before we went on air tonight and I, I was wondering how the pandemic had impacted on your lives and on your, you know, your performance lives. You were saying, Brandon, not really. <laughs> no, we got busier. We got busier. I mean, really what happened was we, we noticed that... Um, uh, there were some people that were sort of uh, doing online shows. They were just going live with their audience and they were playing um, other people's songs, cover versions, right, you know. Right. Um, and we thought, Jeez, well, we find it hard enough to play our own songs and we, we don't know how to play anybody else's songs. So let's just go on and we'll just do one of these and we'll say hello to our audience, and, uh, but we'll leave it at that. And we'll just talk. We won't play any songs at all. And um, 
we call it Ask Us Anything. So we, so we did. And the first question they asked us was, would we play a song? Goodness. Uh, and then, so we, we started playing songs. And before we knew it, we were doing these hour-long shows. And this was going all over anywhere. Like... Let's put it this way. We're, we're, now, we're now on our... What? 96th. 96th show. Every Thursday on Facebook Live and now on YouTube Live. And it's an hour. But, but the kicker is that you can't do the same show. You have to, every show has to be different and every show gotcha. is, our, is our music. But you're going to be seen in America, all over Europe. Yeah. You could be seen anywhere in the world. Well, that's it. I mean, we're getting people from... People even on, are sending us photographs of them, like on a beach, you know, in Portugal with the phone and, uh, you know, a glass of wine beside it. And, and they're sending that into the show. It's so amazing. you're never going to tour again, Declan, is what you're saying? I wouldn't say that. No, that's a bit rash. <laughs> a bit rash. I'm not too sure. I, I have my, I'm but begin to wonder. <laughs> Tell me this. Is it best to be brothers playing music or not good to be brothers playing music? I think it's good. Why? Because there's nowhere to run. I think a lot of bands split up because ultimately, if they don't get on, they can end it. And they'll never see that person again. Yeah. I'm going to run into Declan. Every every family get together. So you have an extra, you have an extra bond that means that you can never break up. But you've been doing this over thirty years. You must be sick of the sight of each other. We have look, <laughs> we have our moments, but I, we we have a sort of like a we're a lot more passive aggressive than say something like the Gallagher brothers, yes. who really obviously can't stand each other, yeah, yeah. Or, or the Everly brothers, yeah. who you know Fairly, wouldn't yeah. even travel in the same limo. Um, with us, it's basically, uh, if Deacon's annoyed with me, he just make one cup of tea in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I can tell, you know, that he's annoyed. How do you keep your music so fresh and so, so, so relevant, Declan, over the years? That's a good question, Terry. I think it just never feels like you've Realised, materialised what you what you started to do. It always changes. Yeah. Every record sets its own different set of you know. You think this will this will be the one. This will be the one. Well, the last one, like Sugar Island, one you the one you did, yeah. like nearly <coughs> impacted on your lives very much so because a lot of those songs are about you. Like Sugar Island is right in the middle of yeah. Newry. And yeah. This is where you guys grew up. Yeah, and I know we sort of avoided actually talking about that, but. Um, you know, I have now two young kids, and when I was walking them through the streets in Yuri, um, suddenly I sort of I, I realised what a, what a different city it was to where to when I grew up. It's now a city, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and uh, it really struck me, and, and also I realised that sort of as a lyricist that I that I felt I could write about the troubles if I put myself in the if I if I told the story through the eyes of a child. Yes. Yeah. Because then there's, you know, you, you're, you don't really have any opinions. You know, once you hit 15 or 16 at that point, uh, but a, a child's innocent, so all you had to do was look at it from that perspective. Yeah, it, it was a magnificent album. You're going to sing another song for us on that yeah. shortly. You have a new album coming out? We do. Or about, when's that going we to... do. It's coming out in March. Do you know, you drop an LP nowadays, do you know that? You drop it. You don't release it. <laughs> no. I'm down. I'm down with the kids. I can you see drop that. it. I can yeah. see that. So you're going to drop it when? We're going to drop it. Yeah. When? We're going to drop it. We're going to drop it in March. Good man. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to sing another song for us. We will. But we're going to take a break first. Okay. We'll have another song. You're going to sing Sugar Island from Sugar Island. All right. In the meantime, will you please thank the two guys, the four of us. <laughs> okay. We're going to take a break. We will be back in a couple of minutes. See you then. <laughs> guys, thanks a million. Thanks. Again. My name is Cora McGoldrick. I am a student in my second year studying a HND in factual television and journalism. My role tonight is a studio floor manager and I hope it takes me into a job in the future. Ready for an epic family day out? Then head over to the Jet Centre. Explore the excitement of Alley Cat Soft Play. Slide into action with hours of fun while also getting time for a coffee break. Arcade more your thing? Say no more. Play games and win tickets. Feeling competitive? There's a game for everyone. Become gem mining experts at the Jet Centre. See what gems, stones, arrowheads or fossils you'll discover. Golf more your thing? 
Practice your game on the north coast with mini golf. Lots of fun to be had on this 18 hole outdoor mini golf course. Or join us for bowling or a movie. The Jet Centre. Entertainment for everyone. Gift and experience to remember with the Hastings Hotels gift card. With unique hotels and no expiry date. Some stays stay with you forever. Buy online at HastingsHotels.com. cinemas are taking you back in time for fantastic family film favourites in November and tickets are just £3. We're kicking off with the original Beauty and the Beast this week at Movie House Cityside, then Gormley, Makara and Coleraine. Book now at moviehouse.co.uk for family favourites at just £3 per ticket. Direct from Sweden. Arrival, one of the world's great Abba shows, performing the music of Abba at the SSE Arena Belfast, featuring original Abba musicians and the Ulster Orchestra. The SSE Arena Belfast, Saturday, the 7th of January. Tickets on sale now at Ticketmaster.ie. Sugar Line, keep your hands together for the four of us.
Thanks, guys. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. That's the, the four of us. Now, this Friday, November the 4th, the film Lyra will open to the public in cinemas across Ireland and the UK. Just that name, Lyra, will be known to us all. Lyra McKee, the 29 year old Belfast journalist, shot dead by dissident Republicans as she observed a riot in Derry's Craigan estate three years ago. I've had the privilege of seeing this film. And I have to say, it's a hard, emotional watch. We were only there for eight minutes from start to finish. I turned to Lyra to say, let's move up further, because I think they're going to rush. And she wasn't there. My heart just broke there and then. She'd been killed. Police investigating the murder of journalist Lyra McKee. Police blame the so-called new IRA. Murder happened on the 21st anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. The film is the work of BAFTA award-winning director and close friend of Lyra, and that's Alison Miller. Alison, thank you so much for coming in tonight. You were a very close friend of, of Lyra. How did you meet? How did the two of you meet? Well, we actually met, I think it was 2008. I just moved back from London, I was living here, and I started making a documentary about the Rape Crisis Centre in Belfast. And I was filming there one day, and there was this young girl, I started rattling around, and I sort of went, oh, hello, and she went, oh, hi, I'm Lyra. And I said, oh, right, and I said, are you on a school placement? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I've just won Sky Journalist of the Year. <laughs> and I was like, oh, right, sorry. <laughs> that was me put back in my box. So. And after that, we became really good friends. I couldn't believe anyone had won that at 16. She was already amazing. It must have been a hugely, because you knew her so well, mm -hmm. it must have been a hugely emotional chore to make this film. Or maybe that was one of the bonuses of making the film, that you were so close. I think the, the it's a funny thing because actually now looking back at it and talking about the film, now we've made it, it's like almost harder in a way because we were all spending so much time with Lyra, making the film in the sense that I used her voice and her dictaphone and archives. So me and my amazing team of people who made it with me um, were with her. So when we finished the film, it was like, well, we've let her go now again, you know? So that was very hard. Um, yeah, knowing her so well was a bonus because I could put in the extra laughs that I knew she was, because she's also really funny. Mm -hmm. And you know, shots we had of archive were walking with that massive bag, and knowing that was in all that was in that bag was a tiny notebook and a dictaphone. But yet she would rattle along, bouncing this enormous bag because that was Lear with her glasses sort of slightly off and on. Yeah, so that was great. And also I was trusted because I knew her sister Nicola and family and her partner Sarah. So it was them because of them really, and her mum, her late mother Joan, who was an amazing lady. They. I'm grateful to they them. They give you all the old footage and... Yeah, they made it with me. They were there every step of the way. It, you, you've made a film of it. Mm -hmm. Why a film? Would it not have been better as a, as a television documentary? More people may have seen it as a television documentary. Well, it will go on television next year on okay. Channel 4. Okay. Um, around, I think it's April, March, April next year. But we also wanted to eat the two bites of the cherry because we wanted to make the longer film. One, because... I mean, Lear had so much to say, and so to cram that into 58 minutes, 56 minutes, it was really hard. So we made the longer film, and then we put it in some festivals, and um, you know, it's, it's won some awards at these festivals, so we're really thrilled. Already won awards? Yeah, I know, it's amazing. How many awards have you won so far? Well, we've been in, I think, four or five festivals, and everywhere we've been, we've won something. Which is amazing. Really, who has seen it in Ireland? Where, where has it been shown so far? Um, it's it went it played at the Cork International Film Festival. It won the Audience Award there, which is I mean amazing because some incredible films there. It was in Sheffield. It was in at the we won the Tim Hetherington Award 
for uh, which was a really huge one. Uh, Akil, we went to Akil Island and played it. We've been in Italy, wow. which was amazing because there was like 300 in the audience and it was subtitled in Italian and they got it. And at the very end of the film, we won Best Documentary, at the very end, this lovely 10 year old boy who was with his parents stood up and he said in Italian, he asked me a question on the panel and he said, um, I want to know where Lear is buried. And I was like thinking, where is this going? He went, because I want to go and say thank you to her. Wow. We were all tears. It's got to be in tears now talking about it. It was so lovely because um, it's her. It's a part of her. She's magical. She's she's funny and brilliant. And I think see, I think this is what you've shown on the film. This is not mm -hmm. a sort of inquest into her death. No. This is a, a celebration of a young woman. Yeah. Uh, her zest for life, her love of what she was doing. Yeah. And I think you've brought that out hugely in this film. Thank you. That was. I think we want all of us wanted. Lyra, because the entry point in sense to the world's media was her death that night and what happened. But then afterwards we were like going, hang on a minute, she had so much to say. So by giving her the film was given her, we want to show off her, her written word and her work and all the incredible work she was doing in 20, those 29 years. We just wanted to say, hang on a minute, do you really know Lyra McKee? Yeah. Well, here she is. She was a huge advocate for the LGBTQ yeah. uh, community. And uh, I want to show a little clip, another little clip, okay. which, when she was very young and she explains about her life then. Okay. This is it, look at this. I'm an LGBTQ gay woman who grew up Catholic in Northern Ireland. I did not find the courage to come out until I was 20 years old. Religion still plays a massive role in this country. And the messages we constantly get from art public figures is that being LGBTQ is wrong. She was a very brave woman. She wrote this letter to herself. Mm -hmm. uh, a letter to herself aged 14 or 15, wasn't it? That's really when she, I think she became to prominence here. Yeah, she did, and she also wrote a piece about the suicide of the ceasefire babies, another a massive uh, piece that went global. So, I mean, she, yeah, she, she was a community woman. She started, she believed that stories were at the end of the street and you could start, and there was universal themes, and I think that's, I think she's an inspiration to any young journalist or person who wants to work in Absolutely. that trade, you can do it. What do you want the audience to take away from this film? I want them to spend time with Lyra. I want them to be inspired. I want them to see the hope and the joy that she believed in and living here in Northern Ireland. And she believed in having difficult conversations to try and change things. So hopefully, you know, we can do that. Have those difficult conversations, make things better. There shouldn't be any more deaths. You see, the, 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 one of the sad things about it all is like presidents came to the to her funeral, prime ministers came to her funeral, the rich and good and the famous from all over the world came. And yet, three years on, nobody's responsible for her death. No, it's still an ongoing, you know, there's, there's, there's ongoing work still in that, but we are, we do live, unfortunately, in a, a place where there's a lot of fear still. And I think that, you know, we do need to change things and she just wants to change things for the better. So. If we can bring that, you know, she was a ceasefire baby, she said the term she created, but she just wanted to change things and make mm -hmm. a better, have a better life. She wanted everyone to have a better life. And sadly, her mum, Joan, died I know, Joan two years ago. It's heartbreak. I know uh, Joan's heart was broken. She never got over it. You know, so many people have been in that position, losing someone here. So we don't need anybody else. We don't need any more deaths. Did you fulfil on the film what you set out to do, do you think? I think so. I don't think I put any more into it, and I think we all did. I had such an incredible team of people. Like, I mean, so many. My amazing editor and all my team and my DOP, Mark McCauley from D Dairyman, and David Holmes, who scored did the all film. The music. All the music for Lyra. He just called me up and said, I want to do this for Lyra. And that's what I had everywhere. Everyone, Jackie Doyle, like, I mean, it goes on and on and on, the family. You know, all the Siobhan Center and from here, you know, the, she was at Channel 4. So I'd, I'd, an, a, an army of people from here. Alison, I think you've done a wonderful job. Thank you so and much. And I hope everybody goes and sees it. It's in selected cinemas all around 
Ireland. Oh, all of Ireland, Ireland from so, tonight. So go see it, go see it. Thank Alison, you. thank you very much thank indeed. You. Okay, we're going to take a short break. See you in a couple of minutes. Bye bye. <laughs> thank you. Hi, my name is Lily. Uh, I study HND motion graphics at Belfast Met. I'm in my second year and I help work on the title sequence for the Jerry Kelly show. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, I'll land myself a job somewhere doing 3D animation. Ready for an epic family day out? Then head over to the Jet Center. Explore the excitement of Alley Cat Soft Play. Slide into action with hours of fun. While also getting time for a coffee break. Arcade more your thing? Say no more. Play games and win tickets. Feeling competitive? There's a game for everyone. Become gem mining experts at the Jet Centre. See what gems, stones, arrowheads or fossils you'll discover. Golf more your thing? Practice your game on the north coast with mini golf. Lots of fun to be had on this 18 hole outdoor mini golf course. Or join us for bowling or a movie. The Jet Centre. Entertainment for everyone. Gift and experience to remember with the Hastings Hotels gift card. With unique hotels and no expiry date. Some stays stay with you forever. Buy online at HastingsHotels.com. House cinemas are taking you back in time for fantastic family film favourites in November and tickets are just three pounds. We're kicking off with the original Beauty and the Beast this week at Movie House Cityside, then Gormley, Makara and Coleraine. Book now at moviehouse.co.uk for family favourites at just three pounds per ticket. Direct from Sweden. Arrival, one of the world's great ABBA shows, performing the music of ABBA at the SSE Arena Belfast, featuring original ABBA musicians and the Ulster Orchestra. The SSE Arena Belfast, Saturday the 7th of January. Tickets on sale now at Ticketmaster.ie. My next guest has the unique distinction of being Ireland's longest living and still working playwright. Just recently he was elected to Astana, the prestigious association of artists whose work is deemed to have made an outstanding contribution to the creative arts in Ireland. It includes the likes of Brian Friel, Seamus Heaney and John Bean Keane, just to mention a few. Not bad for a boy from Turf Lodge who left school at just 15. Will you please welcome Martin Lynch. Come on. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Did you, did you really leave school at 15? I did, of course, at 14, actually. It was 14 to 22nd November. It was supposed to go through to uh, December and leave, and I left about the start of November. To go to do what? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Just didn't leave school. Really? Yeah, so uh, I served my time as a cloth cutter between the ages of 15 and 20. Cloth and for what, for what? 
for jeans, boiler suits, shirts, worked in different factories, worked beside the Morning Star bar for right. five years. But then in between times, I would go to a dock. My, my, my father was a docker, my brothers were dockers, so you got casual labourers, you know, in those days you were schooled daily. So I did a lot, a lot of that. So you were 15, 16, 17, that's what you were doing? Yep. And is that what yep. you were destined for? Well, as a docker, I was destined for that, but I didn't realise, I thought I was going to a dock, but my dad told me when I was 15, if you already had two sons in, you couldn't get a third in. So I was a bit dumbfounded by that. And I went in and I ended up as a cloth cutter. But did the casual dock, and you could go any time you went to a dock, and because we had relatives who were bosses, you could get a check. Right. You so know. had you seen a play? Had you had you read a book? Had you read plays? Had you oh, done anything? I was a bit of a reader, but I'd never I'd never seen play. I never saw my f I never saw a play till I was twenty five. Really? Yeah. And when did you start writing plays? I was twenty six. <laughs> Fair enough. That's true. Fair enough. That was your first time. Yes. You're attributed as someone who has brought the everyday language into the theatre. Like up until you started writing plays, everybody had this pronounced, what do you call it, P or pronounced? RP, rep, yeah. RP, what's it called? I'm not sure what, the, what it stands for. I left school at 15, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> but is that, is that, was that BBC way of speaking, the English yes. way of speaking? Yes, yes. You wrote plays where people, where actors could use their own voice. Yes, yes. I remember the first week of Dockers at the Lyric Theatre back in 19... rehearsals, early 1981. And I'd written the play partially to capture the culture of Sailor Town, the docks area. The way we spoke, the way we talked, like working class people don't say going, being, seen, say going, being, seen. You know, they don't say right, fine, nice, they say fight, right, right, nice. <laughs> so I had to spend the first two weeks of rehearsals with Sam Mercury, the director. They're not, they're not, they're, they're using their G's, using their G's to get them to speak the language in a proper working class accent. And because of that, a whole new audience came along to the opera house and to the lyric and so on. Well, in fairness, I had built up a bit of an audience with Turf, in Turf Lodge. I started the Turf Lodge Fellowship Community Theatre in 76 to put on my first place. And it was the Lyric Theatre board who came to see them in the group theatre, where they brought me up to the Lyric to be resident playwright. And so I had a wee bit of a following at that point. Right. And, and, you know, the people talk today. I don't know if you saw the BBC documentary where people said that the opening night of Dockers was one of the most incredible nights where there was 100 Dockers in the audience and a whole class of people came to Lurik who had never been there before. And Maria Corrigan led the applause, stood up and... All that stuff, so it was a special night. Your plays have now been seen all over Ireland, all over the UK, all over Europe and in, in America. Yeah. Looking back on, 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 your, on your, your workload that you've done over the years, is there one thing that stands out, something that gives you most pride? Um, I think Dockers was a, a, almost a biographical play because of the docks. You know, my, the family were all Dockers and... I was conveying a lot of the stories that had come down through my father. My father was a great storyteller. So late at night he would sit and tell us stories. So all the language of the community I grew in, the characters of the community I grew in, are all in Docker. So yeah. that's a, a, a special one, I'd say. That's stage, you right. You've also dabbled in film. You've uh, co-written the screenplay for the Sam Goldwyn film. Yes, A Prayer for the Dying. A Prayer for the Dying, starring? Mickey Rourke. How do you get on with Mickey Rourke? <laughs> Bob Hoskins, Liam Neeson. Yes, all in it. Liam Neeson's first major movie. Um, yes, but Rourke, Rourke fascinates me. Did you get Maggie, to go? Well, my, my mother and Turf Lodge got a phone call and it was Mickey, Mickey speaks at the end of his mouth, you know, he, very quietly, softly spoken. Can I speak to Martin? And my mother had been used to getting uh, phone calls from the BBC or something like that. But she says, was an American, was an American on, on, on the phone for you? And it was, it was Mickey. And I, I got on great with him. He was, he was a very dedicated actor. He's an incredible hard worker. Great instinct for what he wanted to do. He knew the script he had wasn't authentic. And he wanted to bring me in to rewrite it. So I spent the summer of 86 in London rewriting the script. I'd be, I, I'm holed up on a flat 
and made a veil and I'd write three scenes. And then this is a good thing for you, this is a good one for you. In the middle of London, in the mid 80s, RA campaign, and I was going on. So I walk out into the middle of the road, the old Compton Road or somewhere like that, with an envelope with the scenes in them, waved down a taxi <laughs> and had the sky level to say, bring out the, the films, such and such films, do you most of the taxis just drove on because when they heard my Belfast accent <laughs> and they didn't know what was in the envelope. But uh, it was a great time. And then he, Mickey says to me one day, uh, do you want to go to see Lanny McLean boxing? I'd never heard of Lanny McLean. Apparently he's the king of street fighting. He was right. the king of street fighting. Right. So I went out to Twickenham Cricket Club and Lanny McLean was fighting. He was a guest of, Mickey was a guest of Lanny McLean's. And that was one of the most incredible scenes that I've ever been involved in my life. Burnicle box, or no rules box and gloves, but no rules. Incredible, incredible. And then I brought him to Belfast. He danced with my Muller and Turf Lodge Social Club. Mickey Rourke. Yep, yep. He, he, he came into, into the club and he says, uh, sitting having a drink in the lounge, and the, the senior citizens were having a social in the big hall. I says, Mickey, you wouldn't come in and meet my Muller and my sisters. And here's what he did. He says, yeah, yeah, sure. He says, uh, is there a bathroom? I says, just here between you. So we walked up. He walked into a bathroom. He looked at him and he turned the taps on. Got water in the sun. Let's go. <laughs> and he went in and introduced him to my mother and my sisters. And he asked mommy, my mommy to dance. And he danced around her floor with my mother. What a story. What a fabulous story. What a fabulous story. story. Moment, what a fabulous story. <laughs> I know you're a man of many, many stories. Will you stay on for a moment? Because I want, I want to continue this, because exactly 20 years ago, Martin here collaborated with a young comedy duo, and together they wrote what has since reached cult status here. And that was the hilarious but poignant play, The Troubles According to My Da. That young comedy duo is known as Grimes and McKee, whom the Irish Times once described as bordering on comic genius. Mind you, they did say bordering. Would you please welcome Connor Grimes and Alan McKee? <laughs> Connor, good to see you. Hey. Alan, good to see you. Good to see you. The Anton Deck of the acting world, hey? Yes, mm -hmm. lot richer. Who's that? Who, which? Who is? We're, we're much richer. <laughs> oh, no, no, sorry, them. How did you two guys meet up? We oh. met at Queen's University. In, uh, you went to university? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I didn't manage to graduate in anything, <laughs> but I did go for a couple of days. Um, yes, and Conor Grimes actually was directing a play, yeah. The Entertainer by John Osborne, right. yeah. that he uh, auditioned me in. <laughs> and, uh, Is, are you serious? Here, yes, yeah. yes. I, I had been to the Na National Youth Theatre in London and came back full of uh, chutzpah and sort of pretentiousness. You were or full whatever. of something, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a walking stick and a pipe. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you're uh, 19 years of age. <laughs> yeah, so we were part of the, the, the you know, the Queen's Drama Society. Uh, in, in those days, there was no university degree in drama. So uh, I was doing English at Queen's, and everyone was involved in the drama society. So it was all very serious, was it not? It was very serious, but there was a comic element that crept in, and there was a show that, that these guys were doing in the Belfast Festival at Queen's when it first started, a comedy show, and one of the actors pulled out, and he came to my door and knocked it and says, will you be in it? And I said, absolutely not. I'm a serious actor. Couldn't think of anyone else. <laughs> yeah, was, everyone else said no. <laughs> so we did that show, and a guy, Tim Lone, was directing it. Yes, I and, know Tim. Yeah, and afterwards, Tim says, look, you two hit it off. Why don't you do a show together? Wow. And that was really that. Wow. And you've done so much together. This year, you did St Mungo's. Yes. Mm -hmm. The worst GAA club in Ireland. Yeah, officially. Mm -hmm. Officially. <laughs> For those who haven't seen it, because it was a stage play and then you brought it to television, mm -hmm. which yeah, is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about it, how, how it all came about. Well, well some Mongols again came about with, uh, by... Uh, Friends of ours, a, a friend of Connor's who mm -hmm. actually played for, the, officially, the worst team in Ulster. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was telling us about, you know, the, the, the trials and tribulations of, of playing for this club. and, and what we were thinking all the time of is, why would you still turn up? Mm. Why, you know, you're getting hammered every week. Why would you still turn up? And of course, you turn up because that's your club, that's yeah. your parish. And from that, then, I mean, Connor has a, a, a wealth of stories from like his father and his his, 
uh, uncles and, and all that about about the GAA and about the, the about clubs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we said, well, we may write a show. Yeah, about, well, about we, we had been asked, a, a guy asked us, would you do a comedy uh, GAA show for a fundraiser for us? Yeah. And of course, again, we said, absolutely not. It's not that simple. He just, you know, he was a, a, a country fella. And he was, geez, lads, we yeah. won't do it there next Saturday night for us. <laughs> and, show, boy. Aye, a shindig, a bit of crack. And w while we were trying to explain to him that it wasn't that simple and, you know, you have to spend ages writing and all the rest, he, he actually provoked something because he kept at us. You know, these people that are really determined. And he kept at us and eventually we just went, what about that story your man was telling us about the worst team that, he, that in, in Ireland? That's... that's... That they didn't have, didn't have a win in six and a half years. He said the management just to sit at half time going, so anyway, you were saying there, you were changing the wheels in the car. And, and, and that was the reality of their life. Can you bring it back on tour now, or is, or is that done now that you've seen it on television? Well, yeah, yes and no. I mean, we're, we're actually out in uh, the, the third part of it, St Mungo's, the ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, Fastest we're, growing sport in the world. Yeah, what ladies. Is, what ladies is Gaelic football. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we've got the we, wonderful. We officially know that. <laughs> we've got the wonderful Caroline Curran. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. From uh, uh, Maggie's Fag Run and uh, and all that. So uh, we're going to see that. Yeah, so it's out on the road at the minute. Yes. Right, gotcha. Yes. We're right. in Corre on Friday night. Right. Mm -hmm. You three are well connected. Yes. I want to know about the troubles of Corrine Bada. I love this, mm -hmm. and I can't believe it's what is it twenty years next year or twenty years this year? Twenty years next year. Next mm -hmm. year. Next she year. wrote that. Yeah. It is hilarious. Mm -hmm. You're bringing it back to the Opera House? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Are you rewriting anything or does it stand? Well, we have this, we have this tradition where we, I think we did it eight times at the, at yes. the Opera House. 100,000 so, people have seen this. Absolutely. So we're, after every two years we put it on, we would do the last two years of political events and add on 10 minutes at the end, right. bringing it right up to date every, every performance. So that's what... We're going to be doing, yeah, be doing that, we're we're a version yeah. of that. Because the yes. thing is, you see, you could get into a position where, you know, a play that started off being an, an hour and twenty-five minutes could be two hours and twenty-five mm -hmm. minutes. You know, um, and and we're too old of to be on yeah. stage for that length of time. Is Fireball still there? Fireball still there? Has, has anybody seen it? Any of you guys? There's a few we know. Oh, no. there's a big yeah, audience yeah. out there. Is that a no? No, no, there are. There's, oh, there's there a couple of Who's people. seen it? Yeah. One. One. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Two. One, two, three. The older, the older people. Well, they'll come back. They will come back in, yeah. in the next year. Fireball's still there. Give us a little sample of Fireball. Well, fire, Fireball... He's got a very important job. He's a, yeah, he's a porter in the Royal. He is. Um, uh, very important. Specialist morgue department. Yes. But uh, he, ad he advises the surgeons and all as well. Yes. Every, I, we, we, I played that part and he's a... He's a sort of fool character, you know, but he, he, the lead character in it is the story of Jerry Courtney, is a guy who lives in West Belfast who tries his best not to get involved in the Troubles. But, of course, everyone got involved in the Troubles. Trouble comes looking for him. Yeah, whether you like it or not, you know. Give us Fireball's voice. Fireball. <laughs> he thought I got the wee lisp. And I, and I haven't done it. And, and he, he's got a like very <laughs> blue tongue as well. So yeah. I don't know if I can do it. He loves Jerry with his dart team. He, th he loves darts and he loves football accumulator bats. And he's always <laughs> asking people, hey, lads, you don't happen to know how Halifax went today and stuff. I thought it was Scunthorpe. Scunthorpe, whatever. <laughs> that's, that's another one. That's usually, <laughs> usually when someone's in big trouble, you know, or when they're about to be arrested, he'd come up to the cops and go, well, lads. Does anybody fancy a game of dots? <laughs> or so, someone like that is just improvising here. I, lo I can't wait to see it again, guys. And I know this Christmas you guys are doing your Christmas show at the Lyric. Cracker. Christmas Cracker. Christmas uh, Cracker. Yeah, comedy show, comedy yes. show in the Lyric for grown-ups. We, so for some of you guys will not be allowed. So it's a, it's, a, allowed it's a Christmas show for adults as opposed to an adult Christmas show, which is very different. <laughs> <laughs> very different thing. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, Connor, Alan, thank you so much indeed. It's a joy talking to you. Thanks a million lots. Thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause for our three guys. <laughs> Thanks, lad. That, I'm afraid, is all we have for tonight. So thank you so much for your company. Until the next time, night night, everybody. Night night. <laughs> guys, thanks a million. Thanks a million. Thanks a million.